Welcome to Free Thoughts from Libertarianism.org and the Cato Institute. I'm Trevor Burris, a research fellow at the Cato Institute Center for Constitutional Studies. I'm Aaron Ross Powell, editor of Libertarianism.org and a research fellow here at the Cato Institute. Our guest today is Timothy P. Carney, senior political columnist for the Washington Examiner and a visiting fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. He is also the author of The Big Ripoff, How Big Business and Big Government Steal Your Money and Obamanomics. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Tim. Hey, thanks for having me. Your beat is corporate welfare and cronyism in general. Uh, you're a, a never-ending source of stories that make me even even believe in government less than I already, I already do right now. Uh, but it seems that most people believe that government and big business are – are enemies, um, yes. and you often point out that's not the case. So, why aren't government and big business enemies? Absolutely, I call it the big myth that big business and big government are enemies. Um, and the this is a frame you see when the media talks about it. They say, well, on the one side there's government, on the other side there's business. And one of the reasons that this myth is so useful to sort of the the Washington insiders and harmful to the cause of liberty is that it creates this false appearance of uh, unanimity and consensus. So you see this in the coverage of say the light bulb laws that effectively outlaw the traditional cheap incandescent bulb and requires bulbs to have a higher efficiency. And they say, well, you got tea partiers against it, but even the light bulb industry supports these regulations. Now of course the traditional light bulb was a very low profit margin thing. This was an ongoing problem for the people who made it and a, a testament to free enterprise that the price was kept low. And the bigger uh, – the more expensive light bulbs, they have higher margins, higher barriers to entry and they benefited from – the, those companies benefited from regulations that made us buy those things. And so that's just one typical example of it, that often free enterprise doesn't allow for giant profit margins and government can create barriers to entry. And so it's uh, – I like to sort of turn a lot of the argument for free enterprise on its head and say it's not about these companies making profits. It's about making it hard for these companies to make profits and government can come in and through regulation add barriers to entry. And then uh, a general way I put it is the, the big guys are going to be able to afford the better lobbyists. And so once government gets involved, it becomes a home game for the biggest guys. That is interesting when they say – you know, we look at the Tea Party, we presume they're pro-business and then we say even businesses like yes. this. And we hear that – so you turn us – turn Tea Party people and people who are free market onto the same side as business, which is just constantly where the debate is sitting on this false dichotomy. Yes. How long has this sort of thing been going on? This, I mean how mm -hmm. long has big business been benefiting from government? Because we've got this, this narrative that stretches back quite a long time that of you know, the government is the, the enemy of it, the, the Great Depression and the, yep. the, the programs that came out of that, that it was this attempt to kind of rein in free market capitalism. Don't forget the progressive era, the muckrakers. Yeah, yes, the, the, the big guys were you know, running loose and we had to stop them when in fact they yes. were often – heavily involved in these sorts of things. So is this is – this, how new is this? Well, in, in my, uh, my first book, The Big Ripoff, I, I start at the Whiskey Rebellion where you've got Hamilton talking uh, George Washington into going out and shutting down the – uh, you know the guys doing the moonshining in Western Pennsylvania, and who was cheering on Hamilton in this case? It was the bigger whiskey producers on the East Coast. But the, the one of the greatest places to focus is Trevor, as you said, the the Progressive Era and Gabriel Kolko's uh, Triumph of Conservatism is a book that focuses on this, where he says when Teddy Roosevelt and those guys were and Wilson were increasing government, it was often at the bequest of, at the request of, and to the benefit of. Big business, and so the, the the most famous sort of muckraker progressive story is Upton Sinclair going into the meatpacking uh, plants, and then everybody reads the book and sees how gross these meatpacking plants are. It's an interesting story as a journalist because Sinclair was trying to write a, a socialist thing about the plight of the worker <laughs> and people maybe started thinking, oh, the worker has it rough and then they say, they put what in my meat and they lost all concern. It was human for, beings. Yeah, it's like they were actually people falling into the vats and stuff. But the, yeah. The, yeah and the, uh, the, he said, I aim for the country's heart and I accidentally hit them in the gut was what Sinclair said. And so there's letters that uh, Teddy Roosevelt wrote that uh, Gabriel Kolko, 
who himself calls himself a socialist, he he dug up these letters and he sees Roosevelt saying, I find Sinclair like a completely despicable man but he's very useful here because it allows me to push for increased mandatory federal regulation of meatpacking. And you have the head of the big meatpackers show up in congressional committees and say, we are now and have always been in favor of federal regulation of meatpacking. And Sinclair said, no, this isn't what I was aiming for. This is going to just give a government stamp of approval on the big guys. It's going to create barriers to entry that keeps out the little guys. And so – and you see it again and again throughout where a lot of the attempts at monopoly and say oil and steel, that the market undercut those attempts in the ways that you know they very often do, that you tr everybody raises their prices in a cartel and then one guy is just way too tempted by the idea of stealing all the sales by undercutting the cartel and that they started to go get together and say we're not going to have a successful cartel unless we bring the government into it. So I again I track it back to you know Alexander Hamilton and and George Washington, but you can also um, you, you can see it throughout all of history. Given that this has been going on for so long, and that in many cases it sounds like it was rather obvious what was going on. I mean, it wasn't there was no real attempt to hide the influence of big business on these regulations. Why does this narrative of the antagonism persist? Mm -hmm. why, why does the big myth persist? This is something I've, I've tried to um, look into. For one, there, there are people who find it useful. If you're a big business, you find it very useful to sort of have a, a docile kind of Republican party that's willing to do what you say because they believe it's in service of a higher cause. Um, for two, I think – and I'm a, I'm a journalist as you mentioned and what we're always looking for is a good story. The worst is when you go and you do all your reporting and what you come out is with is this is kind of complex and nuanced. You need to have two different sides and a clear lesson and so that's the easiest way to do it and you just think about the way a reporter does his craft where he calls two different sides and the easiest thing to do if you're writing about say the environment is you call Exxon and then you call Greenpeace. While the more telling thing to do might be to call Exxon and then call General Electric. I actually think that would be a more interesting story but it's a harder story to tell and a lot of the reporters don't even grasp it. When they do grasp it, it's this amazing exception. The New York Times just recently had a piece about, uh, about catfisher, uh, catfishing companies and said that um, these companies that sell this catfish, they were having trouble and so they, they did the unthinkable. They asked for more federal regulation. And of course, that's almost the same phrase the New York Times used when they said, um, you know, the Philip Morris did the unthinkable and they asked for more federal regulation of cigarettes. And then you've got, you know, the all these other companies that that go ahead and they did the unthinkable and they asked for more government involvement. So occasionally they do tell the story, and it's always an interesting twist. Um, I'm glad when they don't tell the story because then I get to write the column and nobody else gets it. And that, that it's interesting. The next uh, question on my sheet is why would big business prefer more regulations? But I also yeah. think it's interesting because sometimes they do. But sometimes when they're smaller, they don't. So at the beginning, they might not want more. How does that work between the big business and the small business? So the in general, I mean, first to sort of list off the reasons why they might like more regulation. The, the simple one, and in uh, my second book, Obamanomics, I call it the overhead smash. Is that regulation adds to overhead? It makes it more expensive to do business. You see Philip Morris doing this uh, in supporting federal regulation of tobacco. It makes it much harder for smaller guys to come in. But the other is uh, one thing I call the inside game. It becomes a home game for the big guys because they can hire the lobbyists. The lawyers working for the big tobacco companies are former FDA commissioners. The small tobacco guys can't hire the former FDA commissioners. And then, and there might, are there even small tobacco companies? <laughs> I mean, like I don't even know so if there, there were are there startup yes. tobacco companies. I mean, can there, I start one tomorrow? There, there have been in the past. I don't know. I yeah. don't know if there are. If there still is, yeah, artisanal uh, tobacco. Probably <laughs> if it's in Brooklyn, if it exists. Mm -hmm. um, but the so there, there's all these reasons to want to do. And sometimes the regulations they want is a mandate. Um, the ob the most obvious ones of these are not on the federal level. It's on the local and state level. The restaurants trying to oppose food trucks. Uh, the taxi cabs trying to oppose Uber. Um, you see it and it's not strictly big versus small though. You do see in a lot of places supermarkets aren't allowed to sell alcohol and the smaller businesses are the liquor stores and they're the incumbent businesses and they might have more sway because they're actually locally owned than the bigger guys. But in general and, – and sorry and so they'll support – 
state and local rules to prevent the bigger guys from selling it. But in general, the bigger you get, I think the more likely you are to support these regulations in part because bigger guys gain the advantage of economies of scale and they can deal with the, the higher costs. They can hire the, the federal uh, – the former federal regulators or congressmen as their lobbyists and also they sometimes become a little less nimble. You see it happening with any company in America. Even Apple, you, you feel them sort of slowing down and getting sluggish and that sort of thing. And so they – the bigger guys are less able to adapt to a changing environment. So the more that you can freeze the environment in place, the better it is for the bigger guys. Yeah, I was uh, – uh, we were talking before we started recording about I was meeting uh, at one point uh, with uh, – Certain representatives of a uh, certain tobacco company who shall remain nameless, who uh, who are being out competed on e-cigarettes right now, and and the, the the problem they face is trying to shift. If e-cigarettes get big and that becomes a growing market, they have to take their entire production line, which is like a huge behemoth moving in one direction, and try and shift it all over to one other thing. Mm-hmm. Imagine what Blockbuster Video thought when Netflix came out, and yes. how much how much they had invested in physical stores and physical video and videotapes, and whether or not it was easier for them to maybe if they could get a lot past that made Netflix illegal or localized yep. or high cost versus trying to switch their entire business over. So it does seem like a generally uh, consistent idea. Do larger companies use regulations against each other? Because most of the examples you've yep. given of either like the big guys against the small guys or possibly like big guys in one category versus big guys in another. But when you – earlier on you yep. said they you know, talk to Exxon and Greenpeace. But it would be more interesting if they talk to Exxon and GE. So you, you do see a lot of times just these, uh, these battles of the, of the titans going after one another. Net neutrality is a great example of that where the networks don't want the regulation but the content providers do. And that's you – know, it can be considered Netflix versus AT&T. Um, um, and then uh, sometimes you do see uh, the guys selling the renewable energy versus the um, the guys selling the the fossil fuel energy, and they're doing the battle. And th- those are often very fun. Some of my favorites, though, are when it's more the the midsize industries where you have the you have the credit unions going after the community banks. Um, with, you know, the credit unions are kind of nonprofit, so they get some benefits. And so the community banks went after them a couple years ago to try to take away their benefits. This so upset the community banks that they started lobbying against a special subsidy that most people didn't know about created uh, during the financial crisis called the transaction account guarantee, which was basically like FDIC insurance, but it went up to infinity. So it was a subsidy to really rich people who kept their money at banks and it was more important to the community banks. And so the credit unions, as far as I could tell, just said, um, well, they came after our special benefit. We're going after theirs and they won. And I was thinking, how did this subsidy get killed? And part of it was just out of spite down there on K Street. So sometimes these fights are, are really to our advantage. I want to ask about motives, which is something that I, I have asked variants of this question on quite a lot of episodes of Free Thoughts. But when I hear stories like this, I wonder – so they, the congressmen who are enacting mm-hmm. these laws or the regulators who are writing them and getting them onto the books, are they – how aware are they of – What's going on? Like when these companies yes. approach them, are they like, "Oh yes, like I, it would be good to pass this thing that will hurt these guys at the expense of these guys or prop up in, um, yeah. profits for a given industry?" Or are they being duped and thinking they're doing a good thing? I think so. There's a, a I always paint a spectrum and of kind of how corrupt is something happening in Washington, and on one end. And this is a story a lot of people tell is basically bribery. And we know this happens. Some guys are in jail for bribery where he says, if you support my – you know, will you support my policy? And the congressman says, all right, give me a $100,000 check and I will and he cuts it and he does it. On the other end – I think that usually comes as a bag of money with a dollar sign on it that they <laughs> yes. give you straight to them. Well, so. with one congressman, it came wrapped in tinfoil and he put it in his freezer. Yes, yeah. Um, <laughs> and so then the uh, – the, other end of the spectrum is that if you – how is the money and politics connected to this? Well, you're only going to get a meeting with a congressman if he really decides that you're worth his time. If I call up my congressman and I say, by the way, I have some thoughts on the Export-Import Bank of the United States, I'm not going to get a seat at that table. But if I've been to his fundraisers and contributed, I'm going to get a seat at the table. Most congressmen often end up hearing for both sides and 
you posit perfectly innocent uh, motives and you could say, well, the guys who are getting the seat at the table are the guys who can afford to cut the check. And when your problem is a problem of concentrated benefits and diffuse costs, then the people paying the costs are much less likely to have a seat at the table than the people getting the benefits. And so the most innocent explanation is that the congressman only gets one side of the explanation. Uh, and that's why he does it. And I think that's largely true. That's truer than most cases being bribery. But what we can't rule out is you think about the role that senior staff on Capitol Hill play. The congressmen obviously are outsourcing a lot of their meetings, their decision makings to their legislative director or their chief of staff or their deputy chief of staff and the congressman himself. They face pressures from the revolving door, from the fact that the guy they're talking to is their former boss or their former committee chairman. That's who the lobbyist is and they know that if they play ball, they're going to be able to afford a suit as nice as that guy instead of wearing the men's warehouse suit that they're wearing as Capitol Hill staffers. And so that's the other thing I need – I think you need to sprinkle in there that does point in the direction of corruption. You mentioned uh, getting into the staff uh, at the great points. Um, uh, we'll get there because uh, you, you, we had talked about the revolving door and you have you love revolving door stories about that kind of corruption. Uh, but you also mentioned a, pr a little bit earlier that about the knowledge of the, transa the transaction fee that you had mentioned for the community mm -hmm. banks. It also seems like one of the elements of this is there's such so much – Hidden nuances to the law that only the people who pay attention to it actually know about. Yes. Right? How many things in what, which page of the Code of Federal Regulations, and only the specific applies to the specific bank in the specific area, so they are the only ones paying attention to it and no one else? Is. Complexity is a subsidy to the big guys. Um, tax code complexity. There was a story of General Electric in 2011 paying near zero federal income tax. And the New York Times ran this and the, the scandal was supposed to be that they paid near zero federal income tax. I, I think every corporation should pay zero federal income tax and I think everybody else, all your listeners should do what they can to minimize the taxes that they legally owe. And Within course, the bounds of the law. <laughs> yes, and of course should pay all the taxes that they legally owe. Um, but the uh, – for me the scandal was that there was over 900 people in the tax division at General Electric. Not that the, it was nefarious for them to hire them. But it's scandalous that it's profitable for them to spend all these guys doing uh, – hire all these guys to spend their time doing that instead of making their refrigerators work better or anything like that. And the, the it, it, problem is on a couple levels. The, the lower level problem is that these guys, unlike a smaller business, can just spend all their time going ahead and moving money around on pieces of paper to minimize their taxes and thus maximize their profit and that's unfair and that tilts the playing field in the direction of the bigger guys. The worst problem is that these guys can call up the heads of the actual business department and say, by the way, if you do your business a little differently in another country or at a different time of month or in a different order, then you minimize the taxes. Well, then they're actually encouraging uh, business activity that's less efficient and less optimal for the economy but is more profitable. And so that for me is a scandal. It both tilts the playing field in the direction of the big guy and uh, you know, reduces economic prosperity. You mentioned the um – for some examples now, because uh, you, you've got so many, uh, you, the big ripoff I think is one of the best books for getting a, a really negative view of government. <laughs> one that can find. Um, so, what, and you wrote about this the first time I think I wrote about the XM Bank was when I read the big ripoff, which I think you wrote in two thousand six. Yep. Um, and now we're still talking about it. Uh, it, it a little bit more now. Can, finally, so, talking yeah, about finally, about it, finally talking say. about it. So, what is the XM Bank, and and isn't it the greatest thing ever? <laughs> <laughs> it is the greatest thing ever as far as making work for me. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, but as, as you suggested that you know, if we got rid of it, there's plenty else I could write about. I'm sorry, Boeing paid me yeah. to say that. So that's <laughs> the export, the export import bank is uh, it's not a bank; it's a government agency, and it actually has nothing to do with imports. Oddly enough, it is a federal agency that subsidizes U.S. exporters. It does it by financing, uh, by giving taxpayer financing to foreign buyers of U.S. goods. So typically, for the most part, this means a loan guarantee to a foreign airline, which is buying a Boeing. So, you know, JP Morgan lends money to Air China because you don't just buy airplanes straight up, you borrow like you would for a house. But instead of JP Morgan bearing the risk for that loan, Export Import Bank does, meaning the taxpayer does. So JP Morgan charges a lower interest rate. Maybe Air China is more likely to buy a Boeing than they are to buy an Airbus in this situation. 
And so a lot of their th- their financing happens with direct loans. A satellite company in Belgium wants to buy a U.S. satellite. So U.S. taxpayers through XM loan the money directly to them. So if Air China decides it's not going to pay back the loan, U.S. taxpayers help out J.P. Morgan. If the Belgian satellite company goes bankrupt, U.S. taxpayers just eat the, the cost of the loan. For the most part, XM hasn't lost money in recent years. It basically breaks even. Um, but its costs are – you know, first of all, Fannie Mae didn't cost taxpayers money for years. But its costs are, um, are spread throughout the economy in, in distortions and I, I write about that in all my articles and in, in my books. Yeah, the distortions being – yes, yeah, they can always say we're not costing the taxpayer anything but they're restructuring the economy around themselves and also as Boeing giving themselves an advantage. Yeah. It is called the Boeing bank Boeing's often. Bank, yes. yeah. 40 percent of their, of their finance dollars go to subsidize one company, which is Boeing. And again, most – the most egregious forms of corporate welfare in my view don't actually end up costing taxpayers money. I think that would make it too obvious and harder for them to survive politically. Sometimes you have to look at these programs in terms of like – Darwinian evolution. Why did they? Why are they surviving? And one of the one survival trait is not being a direct outlay. And so XM's costs are again the risk that taxpayers carry, just like Fannie and Freddie, um, but also the the people who lose business. The most obvious one is the guy who doesn't get the loan. Two guys show up at uh, at Boeing. One is you know Sullivan's Bar, and the other is Air China. And uh, Air China is carrying an export import bank guarantee. Sullivan's Bar loses a loan. Another is the domestic competitors of the foreign subsidized company. Delta Airlines has tried to sue export import bank, saying we lost. We used to fly from Atlanta to uh, Mumbai, but then. You guys uh, came in and subsidized uh, Air India to buy planes for this flight, for this uh, route and they underpriced us because they got subsidized planes. And so now we had to do that and we had to lay people off. And so those are definitely victims of export-import bank subsidies. And then even more, you know, XM likes to subsidize American farm equipment. So John Deere gets to sell more tractors to Europe. That's great for John Deere. But if you drive up the foreign demand for U.S.-made tractors, you're going to drive up the price that American farmers are paying for their tractors. So they're another victim. Now, maybe it means that they're each paying $100 extra for a tractor and they don't even know that XM is involved in it. So you can see why these costs are so hidden and so diffuse. Dan, Dan Eikenson here at Cato is one of the best guys at documenting those, uh, those hidden costs of XM. But if Boeing and John Deere are getting more money for their tractors or I guess their planes and their tractors, how I mean, sure. So maybe other guys are losing out, but more money is flowing to them, and they're not sitting on that money. They're reinvesting it. They're using it yep. to hire more hardworking Americans. So isn't doesn't it help in some ways too? So it it helps some people, yes, and it hurts other people. And so maybe that's a wash, or but the argument for it existing is that it's a gain, and that argument is based on the idea that these bureaucrats on Vermont Avenue know better than the market how to allocate resources. And that's an argument that I don't blame Democrats for holding. <laughs> I mean I do blame Republicans and people who espouse the idea of free enterprise for believing that the government agency is better at deciding where the money goes than the market is. So for example, Elizabeth Warren. Uh, yes. Now you know, she apparently uh, – According to all sources, she hates big business in Wall Street and she wants to bring everything back to the American worker. Uh, but she is not against the export. No, she bank. is for the export import bank, which is again. Has she explained that? It's, it's a Wall Street subsidy, like the most basic level. And I was I go to the export import bank conference every year. And wait, wait, who holds? Uh, do, do they hold it? They hold it. Yes, the government. So do you hold a it. sign outside? Saying, uh, no, I I, I just or? sign up as press, and I was you know drinking at the at the hotel late one night with a with a U.S. based banker, and he said, "Well, why wouldn't we do it? It's it's free money, and it is. They make a loan." And almost all of the risk is shouldered off to the taxpayer, but the interest payments come back to the loan. It is a Wall Street subsidy and Elizabeth Warren supports it. It seems like you could really just infer how much it's worth to them by how much they spend on lobbyists <laughs> to try and keep yeah, it in so place. Yeah, so the Financial Services Roundtable, uh, which represents these banks, uh, they, they're absolutely supporting it. I haven't noticed whether American Bankers Association is, but you see these guys all sign on to the letters to keep it in place. But for the most part, it's a U.S. 
U.S. Chamber of Commerce and it's Boeing that have a real interest in, in keeping this agency in place. Has Warren given reasons for why she supports it? She says she thinks it creates jobs. And again, that fits into her economic view that a government can create jobs. But it certainly cuts against the entirety of her rhetoric that the government, you know, that the banks are, are stealing from us because this is one way in which they are literally offloading their risk onto us. So I say Exim is, is uh, consistent with Democrats' economic beliefs and inconsistent with their populist rhetoric. Now, what about lobbyists? Because we, we keep saying, we keep talking about lobbyists and that word is rarely not said with derision mm -hmm. anymore or, or with uh, yes. absolute disgust even. Uh, I mean, shouldn't we just ban lobbying? No, I mean lobbying obviously is uh, a First Amendment protected right and it ought to be that uh, the government needs input. Congressmen need experts to talk to them. Everybody has a right to petition the government for the redress of grievances. Um, the, I have a, a couple thoughts on lobbyists. The first is that the revolving door really is a problem. And if you just think about it, if you're a Republican congressional staffer and you're one who says, no, no XM, no, no earmarks, no, no ethanol subsidies, um, you're narrowing down your job opportunities afterwards. If you just – and then if, even if you're a Democratic staffer and you get something like Dodd-Frank or Obamacare coming up, are you going to try to sort of – push this sort of socialist agenda or if you're a Republican staffer, a free enterprise agenda? No. The optimal thing to do is to increase government involvement but not take the private sector out of it. And that's exactly what Obamacare and Dodd-Frank were. I'm not saying that this was any motives but I think systematically it's a reason – if you had said I want to make a bill that maximizes the post-passage uh, value of every staffer who wrote this. You would have written <laughs> Obamacare and you would have written Dodd-Frank. And those incentives are bad on the Democratic side and they drive Republicans towards more subsidies and towards stuff, uh, stuff like the uh, post-Enron Sarbanes-Oxley bill where Michael Oxley became a lobbyist for the financial sector. Um, and they, and the, the, a lot of the staffers did too. And so those bad incentives are created by the revolving door. And uh, that's something that I do think we could regulate more because it's about regulating uh, politicians more than about regulating the private sector. How would we regulate that? I mean, would we just say like you're not allowed to work for these guys after you leave the hill? So currently, there's a cooling off period. It's one to two years, depending on you know for for members and for former uh, hill staffers. There's a limit on your ability to contact your former boss. And I would I would dramatically expand that. Barney Frank um, actually had a good rule after I wrote a few articles about his former staffers becoming Wall Street lobbyists. He said, "Well, you know what? Those guys haven't spoken to me since the day they left." He said, "Chairing the Financial Services Committee, if you go and work for one of the companies that we regulate and subsidize, frankly, if you go and work for one of these companies, you are not allowed to talk to me or anyone in my staff for the, as long as I'm the committee chairman." Uh, Republicans could institute that as their own rule. I think that would be a great thing to do. Um, the Congress could pass that as a rule. And again, this is in a restriction on government employees what they do when they leave. You got you know lots of lawyers here who could argue about me, about whether this is too much of a restriction on the First Amendment right. I don't think it is. The cooling off period for senators at two years. There have been bills to make it lifetime. There's a legal definition of a lobbying contact and if you said you're not allowed to make a paid lobbying contact on behalf of somebody else forever, um, that's the sort of bill that I'm open to. Again, uh, I'm not a lawyer but I do think that this is – it's regulating senators and congressmen and how they live their lives. It's not about their ability to petition the government for the redress of their own grievances. It's about – well, first, it's about General Electric's right to hire Tom Daschle to petition the government. It's about Tom Daschle to get paid by General Electric to petition the government. So I do think that restrictions on the revolving door are something that conservatives, libertarians ought to consider. That strikes me though as something that would be potentially impossible to pass, right? Because you're asking – I mean the people who would have to pass it would be the very people who want those high-paying jobs as soon as they leave. You're, you're not thinking cynically. <laughs> what you do that's, is – That's you, a rare thing for Aaron. <laughs> like to... you, you grandfather in the current current members. So then you address the problem in the future and you create a barrier to entry. So for the short term, they're making themselves worth even more. Um, it's just like they did – the Democrats did when they grandfathered in the current uh, spouses who were lobbyists, which was Tom Daschle, Byron Dorgan, uh, Ken Cox. 
Conrad, uh, Dick Durbin's wife, uh, Bob, uh, Liddy Dole's husband. They, they grandfathered in all those people, um, which made you know them the last few women who were you could ever hire to lobby or men to hire their spouse to lobby their spouse. That is a really interesting thing I've noticed in this town in the in the five years I've been here is that oftentimes your your pay. This is not true of most Cato people, especially not me because I've never worked on the Hill. But your your pay is just sort of directly proportional to how many people you know, yes. right? It's just and you you wrote an article recently about here are thirty four. I think it was number thirty four people that Harry Reid's retirement is really going to <laughs> mess up their life because it's it's their reconnection to Harry Reid that actually made them valuable, correct? Yeah, and it is an interesting thing to watch the lobbyists who. Uh, adapt and realize that their former boss is at some point going to retire um, and so pick up other other areas of expertise. But yes, it's um, – when you create – you're creating a special class of people either who wrote the bill so they know the ins and outs and they're really policy people and then door openers is sort of another class of people and, um, and that th those are what our economy is rewarding and that's what people are getting rich off of. I mean – if, if you were to just bring in like an old communist and show him the Washington, D.C. economy, he would say, yes, see, <laughs> this is what I was saying about the corruption. The people who are rich don't actually provide any value. Would you be in favor of uh, – one of the interesting theories too about lobbying and you kind of mentioned it is that – the Hill staffs are, are not that big. They don't get paid that much. They're mm -hmm. very young and the government and what it does is so big and so broad that lobbyists are just ultimately partially a legislative subsidy yeah. in the sense that they, they yeah. know the, about this one little area and so they help for maybe better informed lawmaking. So maybe yeah. increasing staff and increasing salary could be a good Yeah, I, it's, it's one of the things when we point out that what is it, six or seven of the ten richest counties in the, in the country are within commuting distance of Washington, D.C., a lot of is that just really chapter um, having? Is that, just, <laughs> is, that, is, that just, is that the fact that just says everything about yeah. what we're talking about? Today? But it's a lot of conservatives assume that this is about you know the two government uh, bureaucrats who each make one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and that that's a small portion of it. A big part of it is the contractors, the revolving door lobbyists, and that sort of thing. Um, and but I would I would rather us you know pay the the congressmen and their staffers more um, to have more of that expertise be in house. You are going to necessarily need the expertise from from the outside and that is always going to create a potential uh, possibility for corruption. But uh, I, I really do think though uh, addressing the revolving door is a way to take away because the problem with the revolving door is not that these guys are getting rich. It's that they have bad incentives when they're on Capitol Hill. I want to get back to some of these fun and juicy examples of mm -hmm. awful stuff that's being done. Um, you've talked about you call it the, the unholy trinity, and we've got the XM Bank, and the next one is the ethanol, ethanol. mandate. So yeah, we got rid of a lot of the federal actual ethanol subsidies. Did that blow your mind? Was, um, that, was that very surprising to you? No, and again, it's it, you. Once you think of it cynically enough, you realize that I, I, I just got to hang out with you more because <laughs> I'm not I'm not cynical enough here. So you had a tax credit um, where a refiner who bought ethanol got a special tax credit, and of course, it wasn't really a tax credit because. Um, there are some people for whatever reason who didn't actually owe the excise tax but could still get a tax credit. So it was literally a check from the federal government, from the treasury for buying ethanol. Um, and then after that, in 2005 and 2007 in those energy bills, we got the ethanol mandate which basically requires – in a, a complex mechanism I don't totally understand but requires ethanol – requires refiners basically to buy it. So once the mandate was no longer – once the subsidy was no longer driving demand and it was entirely driven by the mandate, it just ended up being a subsidy to the refiners. And if you think about how that works, that ended up being a subsidy to the oil companies and to drivers. So the ethanol subsidy was subsidizing Exxon and uh, people who own SUVs and so that's why Congress was willing to let that expire. But the real subsidy now is the mandate. And by requiring refiners, gas stations to buy the ethanol, it is obviously driving up demand for ethanol, often driving up the price of gasoline, always applying upward pressure to the to food prices. You had uh, tortilla riots in Mexico. I think that was in 2007 or 2008 that that happened and that was partly driven by the fact that agricultural land is going over towards corn ethanol. Corn, ethanol, corn used to be mostly for feeding cows, secondarily for feeding humans. 
now it's mostly for ethanol, secondarily for feeding cows and thirdly for, uh, for feeding humans. And so this obviously has a distorting effect on the market. It also probably is pretty bad for the environment, using up water, um, creating lots of runoff and that sort of thing. And then when they try to do uh, advanced ethanol, there are a lot of people who worry about the effects on rainforests of some of the, the advanced biofuels and that sort of thing. And so it's, it really is just a clear special interest boondoggle. I mean the, the benefit to the, the farmer, the corn farmer is completely offset by the cost to the rancher. And is this entirely because of the present? presidential election going through Iowa or is that, is that overplayed? So I used to think that was overplayed until I saw Scott Walker basically do a 180 degree flip-flop when he went to Iowa um, and that uh, it's, it's a big part of it. Another part is that you – there's so many different constituencies for it. They constantly shift the argument. There is a national security people. You get a lot of people say, oh, well, it's a way to reduce our dependence on foreign oil. I mean nowadays unless you – Count North Dakota as a foreign country. That, that <laughs> argument doesn't uh, doesn't hold as much sway. Oh well, it's for the family farmers is one of the arguments that's made. Oh well, it's good for the environment. I don't think anybody believes that anymore. Um, and so they're they're really running out of uh, out of excuses. But it gets bundled in with other legislation and that sort of thing. Um, and now it's it's a permanent piece of legislation. It would actually take a bill to go ahead and repeal it for us to get rid of this. Now the third of the Holy Trinity is uh, something that maybe our listeners have heard before, the sugar subsidies, which is yeah. which is maybe the most well-known sugar the subsidy that's out there. Yes. Uh, how does that work? Where, what is the origin of that? So this, this one's very complicated uh, in some ways. But it starts with the federal government keeps out foreign sugar. It has a quota. Each country is only allowed to sell us a little bit of – um, a little bit of sugar. So it is the – as far as I know, the most protectionist policy that we have. Um, and then the, the second step of it is that all this – every sugar grower can borrow um, against their own sugar, either the growers or the people who are holding on to it at something like 19, 20 cents a, a pound of sugar. And it's a non-recourse loan, meaning that if the price of sugar drops too low, then they just walk away. And the federal government has the sugar, which then they, of course, turn into ethanol. They sell to the <laughs> ethanol makers to turn into ethanol. And so, this is like a Marx Brothers yeah, movie, yeah. I swear. Um, and so the, if the price drops too low, then the US taxpayers buy it. But the price rarely drops too low even though the world sugar price is often half that, 10, 12 cents. I mean it fluctuates quite a bit. But the uh, – but it often doesn't drop that low, the price in the US because of the protectionist policies. And then there are other things. The, the silos for storing the sugar get uh, taxpayer-backed loan guarantees. The entire sugar ecosystem in Florida is because of sort of the uh, – us kind of draining the Everglades into a bunch of channels so that you could actually grow the, the sugar there and it not be flooded and, and that sort of thing. Um, and again, it used to be justified as jobs uh, program but then the government went ahead and they imported the jobs. It wasn't a question of open borders. It was government boats getting people from the uh, British West Indies, bringing them here, saying you can work here unless your boss gets dissatisfied and we send you back. And there were these great propaganda videos where they'd be like, oh, to watch someone from the West Indies work Work the uh, cane fields is to watch generations of mastery. Now these people weren't <laughs> doing these horrible, back-breaking jobs until we imported them to do it. And so there's all these subsidies. And again, in the big ripoff, I spend about half a chapter on it, with one of my favorite details being about Bill Clinton's uh, Star Report, the you know the report of the special investigator into him, and that during Bill Clinton's inappropriate relationship with Monica Lewinsky. At one point, while they were inappropriately relating, he got a phone call from a congressman and she stayed there. And But at another point, while they were inappropriately relating, sh he got a phone call from uh, one of the Fonjul brothers, the sugar farmers down in Florida. At that point, that was too important, so he dismissed uh, his friend Monica from the Oval Office. I can't. This is. This, I can't decide which which part of that story is, is dirtier. That's the, that's the the difficulty there. So, is it campaign contributions? That's what, I mean a big part of this. Would you? Yeah. How, how does campaign contributions? How do they figure in? Do we need to heavily regulate campaign yeah. contributions? Too? So, no. The 
some of the campaign contribution regulations have had the exact opposite effect. So for instance, right now, you can only give a couple grand. I think maybe now it's 2700 to a candidate in the primary and then another 2700 in the 2600 general. I think. 2600. Yeah, it goes up with inflation. And yeah. so what you what that has an effect of doing because you can't go to somebody and say can I have a $10,000 check? You need to go to somebody and say, can you get me 40 guys who can cut this $2,600 check? Well, who's going to do that? Who's going to volunteer their own free time to do that? Somebody who wants to earn your favor and has a connection to lots of businessmen. That's going to be a lobbyist. So it's a lobbyist bundler was a creature made by that and that seems the most corrupting thing as possible. If you want to win re-election, you need to be able to get these lobbyists and all their clients in there with the room with you. So you, A, you have to make them happy and B, you're going to be listening to them at the at the fundraiser. So a lot of times uh, the campaign finance regulations have the opposite effect. And if you look at what's happened since we've liberalized campaign finance law with the uh, with the Citizens United ruling, you see kind of the birth of an anti-corporate welfare lobby. I mean, you see that these groups like the the Club for Growth or uh, you know Americans for Prosperity or or some of, or some other groups that uh, get started up by people in the in the Coke network, they start lobbying against corporate welfare. Why? Because there's a bunch of you know rich ideologues. And half of them are on the liberty side and they're able to get together. And so you think, what's your financial interest in killing XM or the, or the sugar subsidy? None, except they, they actually want free enterprise. While it used to be the only people who would get together and spend money for lobbying or electing politicians were the people who had a concentrated benefit from it. And so I, I think that the liberalizing of campaign finance in recent years has done something to create an anti-corporate welfare lobby, which is something that a lot of public choice people didn't think was going to happen. I'm curious how green energy subsidies fit into this story because on the one hand, so they seem like an obvious – there's these companies yep. and they're getting loans or loan guarantees and there's lobbying for it and all that. But on the other hand, there's the argument that this is an industry that doesn't really exist in a robust way and we need it to in order for, to get off the foreign oil or yep. to end global warming or whatever, um, compete with China. And so the government is – you know, it's hard to get these sorts of industries off the ground. The government's the one that's got the money to do it because private investors aren't. Yeah, I mean, the, the you you hear all these arguments. Um, I used to it used to be my favorite thing to talk about was green energy because there was so many of these were uh, technologies or industries that couldn't survive in free markets, so they were dependent on this. And you saw and you see so much stuff. But then it got to be that that was the only thing that Republicans identified with crony capitalism. They would simultaneously attack Solyndra's loan guarantees and defend loan guarantees for nuclear power plants. So did you, um, did you step off there? <laughs> so point? I said these you know what the Republicans have the Solyndra thing handled. I might back <laughs> off that one a little bit. Um, but so what I always say when I'm – you look at how Obama and the Democrats talk about the green energy subsidies and they always say we are going to be left behind economically if we don't spend money on it. It's a nonsensical argument but it's an economic one and they're afraid apparently to make the environmental argument which would be to say we should subsidize – uh, solar panels because they produce fewer emissions or in, and less pollution. And one reason is that people don't – people like the environment but they're not willing to spend a lot more on their energy bills to help the environment. And two, there'd be a lot more direct ways to uh, address these things. I mean the obvious answer a lot of people give is if you want to reduce carbon dioxide emissions, you tax carbon dioxide emissions instead of some jerry-rigged thing. Um, because I, I love telling stories about the indirect efforts to do this. There's the, uh, the the corporate average fuel economy standards and a lot of these things where cars have to give off less emissions. And so Alcoa is a company that supports these standards and they say – and by the way, if you use aluminum instead of steel in making cars, they're lighter weight. That reduces emissions. That's great. They support these standards. And then back in Australia, they oppose regulations on greenhouse gas emissions because that's where they make the aluminum and make the parts. A process which is incredibly intensive, not just in energy but also just chemical processes that give off greenhouse gases that are you know, much more potent than carbon dioxide. And so if you actually were to measure the what we call the dust to dust um, economic ecological footprint of an Alcoa car versus a steel car, it's about a break even. But 
they find these other ways to measure it and to try to save the environment and that just allows for corporate gaming of it and, and no improvement to the environment. So um, we mentioned these a couple, but uh, but I know you got a bunch of these, so we can just we can just talk about a few uh, if, in, as we close out here. Your favorite revolving door stories because you just there's yeah. just so many good ones, right? Oh yeah, no, there are. Um, and after I tell you a couple favorite, I'll probably think of others that I wish I had told. <laughs> um, one that I often tell involves uh, Chuck Schumer. Right after the Democrats win control of the Senate in 2007, he goes ahead and he gives a talk to a bunch of hedge fund guys in New York in uh, in January, and he says. Uh, you guys – basically you guys need to grow up politically. You're, you're all scattered. You're not working together. You're working against each other. You're immature. Basically, they weren't spending enough on lobbying. So he has that dinner and then a few months later, he – at the beginning of a hearing of the banking committee or subcommittee says, oh, I just want to say farewell to a longtime staffer. I've had my banking person. <laughs> And her name was Carmencita Wonder and he said, oh, I just want to say farewell to her. She's, she's my go-to banking person and of course she's going to a K Street firm, Brownstein Hyatt, that has hedge fund and banking clients. Within a few weeks of her hire, shockingly, they pick up seven more hedge fund clients including the people who were sitting at that dinner with Chuck Schumer. Um, that election, their spending on politics and lobbying went up many fold, five, six, ten times with two-thirds of the contributions going to Chuck Schumer's Democrats um, and a lot of that money going to Carmen Cita Wonder and who then became a bundler for Chuck Schumer and other Democratic senators. So what I like about this story is that it shows that often the revolving door is not you know, uh, business sort of plucking people off the hill and then using them to infiltrate Congress. But it's the political class deploying their people out to business to extract money and cooperation from the private sector. Oh, that's a good one. So, so the, I guess the question that people would be thinking is well, who's worse, Democrats <laughs> or Republicans? And, and maybe we can tie that in with, the, with I think the last question which would be what do we do? And maybe yeah. that they're both tied together in their own way. So, uh, the, who's worse? This is always – this reminds me of one of my favorite games to play with any libertarian because libertarians often say, oh, well, I'm neither left nor right. But for the most part, they're on one or the other side. And the way you find out is when a Republican does something stupid, are they angry or are they embarrassed and disappointed? <laughs> and when a Democrat does something stupid, are they angry or are they embarrassed and, and – and, um, and so, you know, I by that test, I come down on the right. I call myself both a conservative and a libertarian. And so, I feel more upset at the Republicans when they do it, in part because, again, the Democrats are just basically going against their rhetoric and their politicians. And sure, as a journalist, it's my job to show how their rhetoric is false, but we don't really hold them to it. The Republicans are going against their rhetoric and sort of their stated principles as well. And so that uh, that I think makes it worse when they do it. Who does it more? Historically, I wouldn't want to judge it, but right now I would say you look at something like the export import bank vote, you have half of the Republicans supporting XM, which is shameful. You have unanimity in favor of XM on the Democratic side, which is even more telling. And it's similar with ethanol. It's similar with sugar. It was the same with the bailouts where more and more I think the Democrats just see that government's growth in and of itself is good for them. And so the easiest way to grow government is not to go and battle big business and grow government in the way they oppose but to team up with big business and to grow government in the way that uh, business wants. So. Especially since the Tea Party, I would say the Republicans are a party that's just mostly corporatist and cronyist, and the Democrats are a party that's almost entirely corporatist and cronyist. So, is there any hope whatsoever? Can we do anything except for tear the whole thing down? And yeah, I mean, as I said, I think there's an anti-corporate welfare lobby growing up that most people, if they find out that they are uh, bearing the risk for a Boeing export to a state-owned airline, um, that they don't like that. Most people don't know about it, though, because. You know, again, it doesn't directly cost the taxpayers money. It's one of a million federal programs, and that the more that a lot of it is technology. Um, uh, Mike Needham at Heritage Action said, like, it used to be impossible, or he put it this way: the cost of informing the public about Export Import Bank has gone way down. The cost of organizing people against it has gone way down, and thus um, Boeing's costs of organizing people for it 
hasn't gone way down. They've always been able to just get – XM, give me the list of everybody who got a loan guarantee and we'll get them here to lobby for it. So that hasn't really gone down. So it's, it's tipping the scales a little bit. And so the – I mean in the Export-Import Bank fight, the agency's charter expires June 30th. Again, if you were to poll Congress right now, I think it would pass. You got a financial services committee chairman, Jeb Hensarling, who wants to kill it. You've got a House majority leader, uh, Kevin McCarthy, who said he wants to kill it. And you've got a Senate majority leader, uh, Mitch McConnell, who has voted to kill it. And so there is a chance uh, that you could win on that. And then you've got a Republican presidential field that on XM, on corporate welfare in general, on sugar, on these things is generally good. So I'm not saying that I think we're going to win on all these fights. I'm saying that the odds are better today than they were when I started writing about this 10, 12 years ago. Thank you for listening. If you have any questions, you can find us on Twitter at FreeThoughtsPod. That's FreeThoughtsPod. Free Thoughts is produced by Evan Banks and Mark McDaniel. To learn more, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.